Hi, this is John Doe, and you're watching Mr. Media or something like that. I'm Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. On today's show, I'll welcome a man whose music changed the course of modern civilization, or at least the L.A. <laughs> punk scene in the late 1970s. John Doe, co-founder of the band X. He's just published a mesmerizing new book, Under the Big Black Sun, A Personal History of L.A. Punk. It includes his own essays, as well as contributions from Black Flag's Henry Rollins, Mike Watt of the Minutemen, Dave Alvin of the Blasters, Jane Weedlin and Charlotte Caffey of the Go-Go's, and ex-co-founder and former St. Petersburg, Florida resident, Exene Cervenka. It's a great companion piece to Legs McNeil's Please Kill Me, the uncensored oral history of punk. Doe also has just released a new al- an album of new music, The Westerner, which includes a song he sang with Deborah Harry of Blondie. Stick around, and I promise he'll crawl through your backyard and whack your yappin' dog. John Doe and Exine Cervenka probably never dreamed, when they met at a Venice, California poetry workshop in 1976, that one day they would be regarded as the core of a musical movement that shook, stirred, and ripped corporate rock. Now, I didn't say that they ultimately prevented its rise, I sort of wish that they had, but as co-founders of the L.A. punk band X, they built one of the first bulwarks against the tide of homogenized rock and roll. And even if youth culture didn't ultimately heed their warnings of what lay ahead, Doe and Cervenka left us a legacy of Americana, rockabilly, and rawness that stands up to whatever today's generation of next big things might offer. The L.A. punk scene, fortified with nutrients that included X, Black Flag, The Germs, The Blasters, Los Lobos, and yes, even The Go-Go's, was a regional reflection of what was happening all over the world in the late 1970s and early 80s. Manhattan had its Ramones, Television, and the New York Dolls. London produced The Sex Pistols, The Clash, and Madness. It was an era that captured what rock and roll should be, revolutionary, off-putting, controversial, against the grain. Doe captures the L.A. punk sound in his new book, Under the Big Black Sun, A Personal History of L.A. Punk, which he wrote and edited with Tom Savia, and essays contributed by Henry Rollins of Black Flag, Jane Weedlin and Charlotte Caffey of the Go-Go's, Dave Alvin of the Blasters, Robert Lopez, Elvez of the Zeros, and his longtime musical partner, that would be John's musical partner, and former domestic partner, Exene Cervanka. And yes, I won't miss an opportunity to point out that Exene grew up here in St. Petersburg, an almost product of St. Pete High. In addition to his new book, Doe is promoting a new album, The Westerner, which includes vocals from Blondie's Debbie Harry on the song Go Baby Go. John Doe, welcome to Mr. Media. Thanks. Good to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, did, i got to ask, did you ever dream that one day you and Exene Cervanka and Dave Alvin would be having a discussion with NPR Fresh Air host Terry Gross in which she would be describing X melodies as quote, being a little off and that the notes become flat in unusual places. Uh, I, and I, I asked because actually what happened was I was walking my dog this morning looking for something to listen to, a podcast, and I saw, oh, you just talked to her, so let me listen to this. And she described that, and you took this very long and I thought pregnant pause before responding. And I just thought, what, a, what an odd situation. Um. You dream all kinds of things, you know, when, when you're starting out. You think that you're going to be the best or you're going to be the worst and forgotten. Um, I don't think we could have dreamed it because I don't think Terry Gross was doing Fresh Air in 1976. So uh, hard to say, but uh, it's not the first time that I've people have tried to describe X's harmony in um, somewhat – strange or even backhanded um, compliments. It's, uh, you know, it's just something that we came up with that Exene, I give her a lot of credit for it because she, she didn't know um, traditional harmony. You know, she she would get to that at times, and then she'd stray from it. Um, she just sang what she heard. And um, sure, I dreamed it. I, I dreamed that I would be on stage and playing in a band, and looks like I've done that for forty years. It's it was it was really interesting though to turn, pick up the the Fresh Air podcast 
And mm -hmm. it's the last place I would have expected you to be talking about your music and performing on NPR 40 years later. I mean, yeah, of course, there was no fresh air in 1976, but it was just, it was interesting. And I can imagine, I'm not faulting Terry Gross for her description, because it's a daunting task for me to sit here and uh, write an introduction to you, because I'm thinking, whatever I say is going to sound stupid as well. It's very hard to describe a music such as yours. Well, I think it's uh, it's one of the reasons that we never had a bona fide or valid, uh, you know, validated hit, because um, it's weird, and it's still weird. It, it didn't it didn't fall into um, some category then, and it doesn't now. Uh, the reason that Debbie Harry's on this record of mine is because we toured with Blondie, um, two thousand thirteen, I think, something like that. Uh, or fourteen, <clears throat> and um, they were. Uh, we played a casino in Atlantic City, <laughs> and and there were some people that were probably our age, but looked much older, uh, who had gotten comp tickets from the casino or something like that. And they, these ladies with their long fingernails and uh, leopard print tops, that were there just to you know hear. Blondie do Heart of Glass or Rapture or something like that. You know, <laughs> while we were playing, Exeen was particularly on that night, and she was just being very punk rock and stuff. <laughs> they were putting their fingers in their ears, and they were like, <laughs> "Ew, I don't get this. Oh my god, I don't know." So uh, I felt like that was a great success. Um, <laughs> I think the closest uh, the closest description that people have given for Exeen and My Harmony is. Uh, you know, hillbilly. Uh, it's it's some you know has some some of that uh, quality to it. Appalachian, you know. Uh, but like I say, you know, it's just it's just what we came up with. There, that was the beauty of um, punk rock and LA punk rock in particular. It was just a bunch of people making up stuff. You know, they just made it up, and there was no calculating. You just did what you did. It's interesting that uh, you, you would play the gig that you just described. I mean, with, with the, the benefit of perspective and several years passing, I mean, the, the music of X, it's quite distinctive, but it doesn't sound out of, uh, out of character or for any other, you know, rock music of different genres. I mean, you know, we, today, in 1976, 1978, you, you wouldn't split rock in, into so many different you know, new wave and this and that, and it, it, it was a lot. It was a lot simpler. It was becoming more corporate. But now, if you could, you could put uh, an X song on the radio and put it up against a, a Twenty One Pilots or a Same Motel or something, and it doesn't sound out of place. It sounds, uh, it, it it fits, it fits what you know different music is. It sounds different and yet alike. I think. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some records and, and bands that sound uh, like they were recorded at exactly the month and year, and you can you can pinpoint it, mm -hmm. and they're great for that. Uh, and there's some recordings and some bands that seem to be more timeless, and that's good too. You know, um, we never really used tricks. I I, I think that was something that Raymond Zarek really helped us with in our recordings. Um, you know, Billy and DJ and I all had a lot of musical history, had played with, uh, you know, different styles of bands and different, uh, you know, new different genres, blues and rockabilly. And, you know, DJ was a big fan of Captain Beefheart and Frank Zappa. So I think that's, and we kept, uh, asking them to play fewer cymbals. Um, so we all developed that style by, by having, you know, a common vocabulary, but having a pretty broad, um, musical education, um, which a lot of, we had to forget, you know, we had to put aside in order to, to play or make up what we did. You know, I, I think that was a, uh, you can't overstate that at the time, you know, drawing a line saying that was then this is now, um, we're not going to use all the songwriting or 
uh, you know, technique in playing. It was playing from your gut rather than from your head. And, and I still, I still do that. I still think that's, that's valid. <clears throat> As you, you mentioned a minute ago, you were talking about songs that sound almost kind of timeless. I was actually thinking of The Doors, and you, so you mentioned Manzarek, and maybe, maybe, maybe he's the common thread there that makes the X sa- sound in the songs sound so timeless. They do not sound dated, I mean, the, uh, for whatever reason. Well, yeah, I mean, he didn't, he, he didn't have to fix anything because it wasn't broken. You know, I think maybe that's the similarity between X and The Doors, is that we were fairly realized by the time we were recording, and um, and we did have uh, knowledge and a and an eye towards the past, but also towards the future. Um, yeah, he just you know Ray was a great producer because he just got good performances, and um, you know he did did the first four records um, that were all within like a year of each other. Pretty pretty crazy amount of uh, output. But. Tell for for people who who don't get it. Tell tell talk a little bit about how uh, X and Black Flag and and the Go Go's, the Germs, uh, these other bands coexisted and, and and supported each other. They seem today you would think they had absolutely nothing in common, and yet as reading through the book, one of the common threads seemed to be actually you and Exene that. So many of these bands revolved around you guys and your success, and you were you were very helpful to them. But it's hard to imagine that 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 scene contained all of these bands. Um, <clears throat> well, in in this the the reason that the book is structured the way it is is because the scene was a collaborative and a community, and maybe that's why people should care about it. Maybe that's why people do care about it. That's why they're interested in it still. Um, it was a community that had to rely on each other because there wasn't, there wasn't a, uh, like a skeleton or a structure for us to fit into. You know, there was a lot of disco, um, meaning not just the type of music, but just, you know, DJs dance, you know, not live music. Mm-hmm. And and that was in LA, you know, that was in the, the so-called like media music center of the U S. So that's, that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. And, and we, and once we realized that we thought, we thought, well, this is perfect. We can just take over the city and have a whole music scene. And, and that's kind of what we did. But, um, my co uh, uh, cohort colleague Tom DeSavia, who who also wrote a few chapters and, and helped uh, one of the other authors finish her chapter, um, he kept haranguing me to to write this book, and I was uninterested. And then I had a uh, a moment of inspiration and realized I could be Tom Sawyer and get all these other people to help me paint the fence. Um, and then I avoided being the authority. I avoided being like telling the truth, the history with, you know, italicized. Um, Cause I think there's all kinds of truths. Everybody has their own truth. And, and we, um, Tom and I figured out what are the most important elements of the scene and, and what, you know, who's an expert in those elements and who are the people that, they can put a few words together. So everyone had a topic. Uh, and, and it's kind of clear, I think. You know, Jane Wheedlands is about uh, where people lived because that was really important to the scene. Um, that's where everyone, nobody had any money, so people would just get over to each other's houses and have a party and drink and carry on and, and um, figure out what was and what wasn't punk rock and what was what were their experiences and what was their art and et cetera. Wait a second. Hold on a second. So sorry. It's all right. Let me turn that off. Somebody tuning in with an alternative voice on what you had to say. <laughs> yes. Um, hold on one momento. Sure. 
airplane mode. Enable, and yes. Um, anyway, so Jane lived at Canterbury. There were probably 15 other apartments that were, um, 15 other apartments that were living, you know, the, where punk rockers were living. The rent was probably 250 bucks or, or less. Um, and so that was su- incredibly important to the, to the scene. So Henry Rollins's uh, topic was coming was uh, what was it like for someone to come from DC, which is a fairly small scene to a much bigger scene in LA thrust directly into this uh, early hardcore scene. Um, the conflict of that with the, with the uh, original Hollywood scene, you know, Mike Watts is similar, but it's coming from a, a point of view of someone from San Pedro, which is further South, but he had experienced the early Hollywood scene. And that was kind of what inspired the Minutemen to, to do what they did. And, and the, you know, the, the wrestling, the conflict between those two scenes and, and, and Mike, Mike Watts seeing like how people misunderstood it, uh, you know, misunderstood what punk rock was supposed to be about. And, and that's where the eclectic, um, stuff comes in. You know, there, there are so many bands that, that are unknown, but, but hopefully will be a little more known like the deadbeats or black Randy and the Metro squad or the alley cats or the plugs or, or all these bands that weren't included in the decline of Western civilization. Cause, cause that movie was just, uh, geared to be sensational. It was geared to be nihilistic and, Oh my God, you know, people clutching their pearls because, what's gone wrong with the youth of today. And it was just, you know, I understand that. I don't agree with it. I understand that you have to have a point of view to make a movie, but, um, it didn't, it represented a very small, uh, part of the LA music scene at that time. Kind of, kind of, sorry, that's my, my phone. Kind of seemed like your book needs a, a soundtrack of its own. You know, it needs like, it, it like it needs to come with a, with a, a CD, <clears throat> a, a double CD or something. <laughs> well, music. you know, we, we tried to do that. It was, uh, too many different recordings and who knows, you know, what, but we leave it up to the people to, to, to discover that. Um, on the other hand, there is a, uh, an audio book, oh. which is kind of amazing. Um, is that, is that voiced by the different, uh, contributors? Yes. Oh. All the, all, it, and it was, kind of a miracle that we were able to, I mean, most of the people still live around LA. Um, but yeah, Jane and Charlotte and Henry Rollins and Chris D and, uh, you know, the, the other legit writers like Christine McKenna and Chris Morris. And, you know, so it's pretty cool. I, I think in 15 or 20 years, that's going to be a, you know, kind of an interesting document to, to hear that voice from that era well you referenced some of the uh, the essays of the authors of essays that i was particularly uh, taken with uh you talked about and you had mentioned community before how important that was that comes across really strongly in jane weedland's uh uh essay at, at the front of the book the thing about the jane weedland thing that blew me away was am i the last person on earth to know to, to not know how interesting jane weedland's personal life was i mean did you guys know that before you <laughs> saw the chapter <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I didn't know, um, that it was going to be quite so sensational and <laughs> quite so, quite so, uh, saucy. Oh my God. But, uh, yeah, you know, uh, we knew that, <laughs> that was something that kind of got, um, overlooked, uh, once the Go-Go's, I mean, the Go-Go's basically made the same kind of music from beginning, from their beginnings. Um, maybe the earlier songs were a little more jagged and a little more punk rock, but I mean, it was all pretty, um, pretty pop. And, and that wasn't necessarily a bad thing, you know? I mean, what, what's gotten the, the history that's gotten rewritten is, is, and, and we kind of address this in the punk rock songwriting, uh, chapter. Um, once hardcore came in, then people defined punk rock as that, 
And, and it's because I think it's easy and it's kind of palatable and it has a, a certain look and it has a certain sound that, that can be um, boiled down to, to you know, or, or um, caricaturized. Um, but if you think of the New York scene, if you think of the London scene or the San Francisco or the L.A. scene, it was all over the place. It was it was more what punk rock was more what it wasn't than what it was. You know, it was like making up your own mind. And Blondie certainly was really pop, and so were Talking Heads and and Ramones in their own way. I mean, they they were trying to rewrite Phil Spector songs. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, and the you know the the variety between X Ray Specs and the Sex Pistols and the Clash and Susie and the Banshees, I mean that's pretty broad too. So, it, yeah, it, it it just got kind of I wouldn't say um, simplified, but it it, it became more. Um, yeah, you, you were able to kind of classify hardcore as a as a genre, but at the beginning of that too, you know, it was it was pretty uh, all over the map with. Black Flag or the Minutemen or Saccharin Trust or China White and these other, you know, the crowd was a, you know, total kind of surf band, but they were lumped in with the hardcore scene. So, well, so yeah. I mentioned uh, <laughs> Sweet Baby Jane Weedland, who it just, folks, if, you, if, you, if you're watching this, you're listening to this, you need to read that chapter. It will blow your mind if you don't know, if you don't already know anything about Jane. So it's fascinating. One of the other chapters, though, I thought was really interesting um, is uh, Mike Watts' chapter, um, which to me was more like almost like a, a love letter to Dee Boone, his uh, lifelong friend. And it was very sweet. And uh, again, it struck me as a little out of character for what I expected, but it was just, it was very compelling. Um, and that's what was so interesting about the book is that you get these different voices. And well, I, I get what you were saying about, you know, being Tom Sawyer and getting other people to help you f- paint the fence, it actually, I think, has the effect of making the book and the scene that much more interesting because you really get this greater sense of the voices that were behind it. We were lucky. You know, we were very fortunate that everybody, uh, A, wanted to contribute and also that they had a distinct style of writing. And, and we encouraged that. We had to do, um, I had to do some hand holding and some editing and some come on, you can do it, you know. uh, But once I saw what they could come up with, then I just continued to encourage it and, you know, kind of doing some writing 101 stuff like, well, what kind of car did you drive from San Diego to L.A.? And what kind of guitar was that? Rather than saying, my favorite guitar, you know. So to, to give more detail, but you know, that's the big difference between this book and Please Kill Me or We Got the Neutron Bomb is that you have more, I think you have more context. Mm-hmm. You you can see what the city was like and the city is definitely a player in this. It's a character. Uh, Los Angeles at the time is referenced a lot. Um, yeah, I wanted to, and, and, and you have to fact check. I mean, there were some things in, in Jane's and, and other people's uh, chapters where we would get sued. <laughs> we couldn't say that name. And so we uh, became some other name and, you know, uh, um, but everybody had these, you know, crazy, uh, you know, Damon Runyon kind of monikers anyway, you know, Sherry, the penguin and Tony, the tiger and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So, um, but in writing a full chapter, you know, writing, 2,500 to 5,000 words, um, you had to look at it and say, is, is this what I want to say? And, and it wasn't just somebody calling you up and saying, hey, give me some dirt on D.D. Ramon, right. you know, which is great. I, I, I respect that, but we wanted to do something different. Um, with Mike Watt, you know, I mean, the, that was kind of the magic of the Minutemen, and, and that was the story we wanted to tell, which was, People that made something out of, uh, they were inspired, you know, and, and he makes he makes it clear that when he, drew, you know, found out that there was music going on in Hollywood, he and, and Boone went up there and saw it and thought, 
shit, I can do this. Right. This is no magical, you know, mystery, like, whittle, 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 you know, after I can, sure, we can do this. Let's write a song. Okay, let's write a song. So then they did. So that was the magic of that, of that time, making something out of nothing, you know, making, you know, using whatever, um, ability and creativity you had to, to make a, a poster or to, um, be part of a magazine like Chris D talks about slash magazine a lot. And, and the, uh, uh, pleasant talks about pleasant game and talks about lobotomy, which was a fanzine that she did. And, um, it all, you know, furthered the, the kind of small, you know, at first there were a hundred people, you know, then there were a thousand people in three or four years. Now, there's a big difference between you, I think. I mean, I don't know you personally, obviously. This is the first time we've, maybe the second time we've spoken. Uh, but uh, th- I think there's a big difference between you and, say, Henry Rollins. And it was interesting to see him included in there in Black Flag. Black Flag's music was very different than a lot of these other bands. It was very angry and hardcore. And there's a description, and I, I'm blanking now. I don't remember if it was Dave Alvin. Someone described opening for Black Flag. Was that was that Dave or was that somebody else? I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, I think it was, yeah. Yeah. At the Olympic Auditorium where right. he got a beer thrown at him. Uh, I assume over the years you, you've been, especially at that time, you've probably been to a Black Flag uh, concert or two. Can you tell people what that experience was like? And how that was different than crowds that would come to see X or the Blasters or the Gurus? <clears throat> um, well, briefly... Uh, once once everyone discovered that there was some new music going on, it was it was kind of fast and loud, and and then uh, there was a big skate community. Tony Alva was was just coming up then, and you know a lot of kids that were latchkey kids were trying to figure out where they fit in, and they were trying to figure out how this disaffected suburban culture could express themselves so whether it was surfing or skating or or being in a rock and roll band that's what was driving people towards um their identity so at the beginning there's all these different kinds of bands and we are playing that there is a certain aggressiveness there's a certain speed and volume and it's loud and it's but it's free and it's a little dangerous and and you can you know decide what you want to do there's no um road map or or there's no protocol of like how you're supposed to act so you go out and you just do shit and you just you know react whatever way the music is telling you to react so then it gets a, the scene gets bigger and then there's a lot of younger uh, younger bands, I would say some maybe like the middle class was was one that started playing faster than you know than we did or something, and and that became one of their monikers is to play faster and to be you know a little more violent. And then you know Black Flag. I mean, you have to remember that Black Flag came along fairly early, like seventy eight, seventy nine, when Keith Morris was the singer, and then. Des Cadenza and then Ron Ray's and then finally Henry Rollins was what 81 82 you know so by that point there was definitely a beach sound there was, it was faster more aggressive and so like with Jack Grisham and TSOL he has a chapter in there mm-hmm. they're talking about how they were getting beat up by you know jocks and surfers and shit like that and they really felt they had to protect themselves so then there's just young testosterone driven surfers that have become punks and their you know their idea of having a good time was just crashing into each other and they were all healthy california specimens so they, you know they'd fall down they'd get up and no problem but then it became a little more aggressive and a little more <clears throat> Um, that's when the mosh pit started and before that it was just more free expression. I was reading about that and I was thinking back to 
I want to say maybe 83, 84, going to cover the clash in Orlando at the Orlando Highlight years ago. And uh, I, I love their music. I uh, was a little wary of going to the concert because of the same kind of atmosphere that was described at a Black Flag concert. And it was like that. It was very, very testosterone-fueled, very aggressive, very angry people in the crowd. And I just, <laughs> as I was reading about the, the description of being even backstage at Black Flag show and the going on stage ahead of them and the the way that people were treated, I thought, wow, I'm so glad I missed that because I just, you know, I, well, it was exciting. It was exciting. You just had to keep your eyes open while you're on stage <laughs> or in the audience. Uh, you know, it's like, do you, what do you want to do? Do you want to go see a jazz concert? Do you want to go see a classical music concert, or do you want to go see rock and roll? You know, I don't. You know, that's one of the reasons that we included the Jack Grisham. <clears throat> Excuse me, because even now it, it, his attitude is: uh, "You guys started this shit. We came up and finished it. What's your problem?" Um, and I respect that. It's like okay, it kind of messed up things for you know for some of the other bands, and it, and it became a little more of a uh, like this is what punk rock is. Um, the sound maybe became a little more codified or, or something, but that's what happens. It comes and it goes, and, and you know, I'm just glad that we're able to tell the story and there are enough people that, that give a little more like 3D version of it. In the book, you give, uh, you, you give kind of a description of, of the mis- misperceptions of what punk rock was about. Uh, I won't ask you to repeat that uh, and go through that. It's very easy to read in the book, but is there is there one key misperception that you think still lives to this day? Yeah, just what we've been talking about that punk rock is is hardcore. Mm-hmm. You know the the like we were saying I was saying before. You know, in New York and in London and San Francisco, there are all different types of of uh, creative, expressive people that found different ways of doing it. You know, there's nothing. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. That that's what's uh, attractive about it. <clears throat> the the scene in the book describes bands like X. There's uh, there's the lower middle class bands. There's there's uh, there's the all go- girl bands like the Go Go's. There's gay bands. There's gay. how would it be different today? Would there, be- <laughs> there was not there were not gay. Not bands. a gay band. I'm sorry. Let me, there let me were, rephrase. There it. were you know gay there were members there really of bands. In- it was really inclusive, yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I don't mean gay bands. There were there were people who were outwardly gay, participating in bands, yes. playing in bands. That's yeah. I, I I stand corrected. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but it didn't seem like there were were there any black bands in that scene? Uh, not all, but there were there were a lot of uh, African Americans in in San Francisco and in L.A. Yeah. Uh, Carlo Mad Dog. Carlo Mad Dog uh, played drums for the Controllers. Um, there was a guy named Snooky Tate up in San Francisco. I mean, it wasn't um, 50-50 uh-huh. by any means, but I think the the main minority group uh, would be women, <laughs> yeah. um, even though they're not a minority. If there's if there's one thing that people don't know about punk rock, it's that it. Uh, it allowed women to be players. It allowed women to be f- complete participants and, and not just a showpiece. Um, people like Exene or Alice Bag, and there was a, a, a big Latino um, contingent in LA. Um, you know, that's that's part of the. It democratized that, hmm. and and it was it was. It kind of went on through the um, indie rock scene from the you know late eighties, nineties, the Pixies and and that kind of thing, uh, those kinds of bands, and then progressed into the Riot Girl scene, and and then and then seemed to take a, a huge step backward, you know, um, and and now I think it's it's back where it should be. Gains were made, gains were lost. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the introduction to the book is uh, by Billy Joe Armstrong of uh, Green Day, who uh, – it's it's still amazing to me that that band's been around for more than 30 years. And yet 
uh, he kind of laments uh, in the introduction that he missed your era of being able to he just they just came on kind of at the tail end of that or a little little past it but is it, it i don't know if you'd agree with this i, I think that like green day and uh, pearl jam nirvana they have a great element of what you guys were about i think that you can hear it in their songwriting and the the sound the speed of a lot of their music do you feel that you know that that's uh, that's accurate or would you disagree with that no i would totally agree with it I think that Green Day is uh, uh, heads and shoulders above most of the bands that they're associated with um, as far as their songwriting. Billy Joe is a friend of mine, <laughs> so, so I, you know, that, that, that also helps. But, um, you know, he, 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 he appeals to and is connected to a, a different generation of punk rock. And it's uh, their, their band and... Uh, had the same kind of scene in Oakland, you know, and, and it's kind of amazing that the, 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 um, the gig that they all started at on, on Gilman street, that that still exists and it's still run by kids and it's still like volunteer. And, um, they still have punk rock bands all the time. It's kind of amazing. And, And that was in 91, something like that. 90, 91. Um, so I think there is a lot of similarities and, um, <clears throat> their version of punk rock, uh, uh, brought it to the teenagers that I think it was intended for originally, you know, the Ramones and, and us were playing to, you know, artists and bohemians and, and misfits and weirdos and stuff like that. And we kind of wanted to, to appeal to, teenagers and, and people that just were like forming their musical ideas and saying, come on, just do whatever. Don't, you know, don't buy the, the white bread. Come on, try something different. Is there any decision that you and Exene and uh, Billy and DJ for that matter made uh, during your run that you wish you could have changed in terms of maybe, maybe there was an opportunity to market the band more commercially or do something. Was that, you know, was that ever a part of the past? Was there something that you wish you'd gone back, you could go back and say, you know, instead of saying no, let's say yes to that and see how it affects us. (laughs) Oh, I think we might've said yes too much. (laughs) Really? I think we might've tried to, tried to fit in a little too much and, and didn't just, um, uh, yeah. Um, but we were always, um, accessible you know our music was our um yeah we, we weren't trying to piss people off we just <laughs> we just did it naturally <laughs> uh but at, at, on the other hand there was no marketing there was no thought of you know the the term barely existed um you know the way you you were DIY is that you just went out there and met people and lived your life and did your thing. You know, I mean, it was, uh, and yeah, I have no regrets because, because that's a, a very slippery slope and, and, uh, that's the way you get cancer and <laughs> weird <laughs> shit like that. All right. Well, no one wants to wish that on anybody. Just, no. Um, did doing the book and and having it out now is, any desire on your part to go back and do just a complete book of X? Because I mean, there's a lot of stuff like Billy and and DJ, for example, don't figure as much in in this as maybe they would if. In you know, I felt, I came away from it feeling like I want to know more about those guys now, even mm. more, you know. Well, um, I'm thinking about doing a memoir, a autobiography, so. If that happens, or when that happens, yeah, I'll I'll do that. Um, I hope it does give people. If Elvez wants to wants to write more, if um, uh, you know some of the other uh, some of the other authors, if they want to tell, if Jane wants to tell more of her story, uh, I think she could. I think it gives them the opportunity to do that. I definitely like to read more of Jane's story. You can tell her I said so. I. <laughs> my, I, I thought I thought the steam steam was coming out of my ears when I was reading it because I'm thinking, oh, it's Jane Weedland. She's that sweet girl from the Go Go's. She's so, and I'm like, holy crap, what the hell am I reading here? This, th- I, I had to go back a couple times, 
that was the one thing. A couple times in the book, I had to go back and see, remind myself who was writing that chapter because I just thought, no, this can't be. This can't be. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, about some songs in particular. Um, and I, I wondered which song of yours, whether it be solo or from X, is there a song that you've, you you would like to have people go back and take another look at that maybe got overlooked over the years that you know you're particularly proud of? Oh God, that's a tall order. Uh, if there's you know three hundred and some songs, um, I kind of did that. I, I did a, a solo, a, a double solo LP last year. It was a best of. Um, <clears throat> not a greatest hits because I didn't really have any hits in quotes. Uh, and I kind of did it with that. Uh, but you know, the way X is playing now, we we're doing more, uh, more of a concert than just a rock and roll show. Hmm. So we're, um, we have another player that, that comes in and plays drums when DJ's playing vibes and plays drums while DJ's playing vibes and Billy's playing sax. Um, so we get to do crazy songs like come back to me or I must not think bad thoughts. And those are kind of deep cuts and they're, they're as we had, you know, started expanding and, and realized that somehow we could still fit this into the, what our idea of punk rock was. Um, so maybe I must not think bad thoughts would be one for, for X because it, it's still relative, you know, it's talking about being involved in a bullshit, shitty war. Um, it's talking about <clears throat> people not being heard, uh, musically, um, talking about alienation and trying to, to still rise above the, um, you know, what you're given. It's a yeah. great, it's a, I'm smiling. People can't see this, but I'm smiling while you're describing that song. I really love that song. Uh, it was one of the one of the songs that's always stayed stayed with me in my head. And I I got to tell you, one of the things I always liked about your music, and I don't know how you'll take this, is I always like I like the melody. Sorry, sorry, uh, Terry, but I, I always like the melody. I like the tone. I like the harmonies. They, they were a little off, a, a little. They weren't quite what the Beatles did, which made them more entertaining. I thought, and some of the, no, I mean, and I say that in a good Haven't way. Haven't you heard the Beatles like enough? <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. The, listen, in my yeah. life, I think I've heard. Sorry, I didn't mean to make a song reference, but I've heard enough Beatles, enough Eagles, <laughs> enough Led Zeppelin. You name it. The, the Doors, they always have a place, but those some of these bands, yeah, I know. Uh, it's just, um, and what's a song that uh, other musicians want to hear you play, or that you find that if you're talking to someone, that they bring up a lot. Uh, hmm. Maybe the uh, of of the X songs. Maybe uh, the Hungry Wolf, hmm. because it it's a different spin on um, Bo Diddley, and uh, and and kind of blues music. Um, and then a solo songs probably um, a song I did about seven or eight years ago called twin brother pretty sad song about uh about these <clears throat> two kids and uh unhappy home life um you know it just depends okay. uh just a couple more things we'll let you get out of here you've been very gracious and w- with your time and i appreciate that. oh well thank you. <laughs> that's my moniker you know just being <laughs> just uh, the the new album, uh, the Westerner. We, we you mentioned before uh, how it is that uh, Debbie Harry turns up on it. Is there a are there any particular theme or themes running through that album? The West. That's why I called it that. Um, it's dedicated to a friend of mine uh, who passed away. He's a, a writer. Uh, he wrote Dances with Wolves. He wrote a sequel to that called The Holy Road. Uh, Michael Blake is his name. And, um, you know, just with Dances with Wolves, he changed the whole conversation about uh, Native Americans mm-hmm. in the U.S. I mean, it's the first time people thought, huh, they're not savages. Huh, they have a pretty complex culture. Golly gee, Marge, why didn't we know this before? And, you know, of course, a lot of people did, but a lot of people didn't. And Michael and I were great friends, kind of like uh, brothers. 
and um, <clears throat> he had Alzheimer's, so I was kind of writing songs using him as a character or writing songs about his life, and then I realized, oh, this is kind of a theme, and um, he was born in California and lived in New Mexico, and, and um, I had become really close friends with Hal Geld maybe 10 years ago, and Hal uh, basically has been working in this band called Giant Sand for years and years, and they've influenced people like Calexico and Nico Case and and worked and, and really uh, influenced their sound. And uh, I felt like my friend Michael was living in Tucson. Hal was from Tucson as well. That's where the studio is that he works at. And I thought, well, I, want, I would like to be in Tucson to see my friend Michael. Hal was there, so why don't we do some recording? And, and it all just moved on from there. Um, so the, the theme is the desert. The theme is uh, space. The theme is um, the sounds are uh, kind of psychedelic at times because that seems to somehow fit with the desert because the desert is a psychedelic fucking place to be and um you know lucky enough to to get great people to to play and sing on it the we're going on tour in june uh through the middle of july rock and roll band uh jesse dayton is uh playing guitar and he's got a you know people can look up his stuff he, he's more of a rockabilly uh player and um cindy wasserman who i've She's also on the record. She sings with me. We've sung together for probably 12 years plus. And um, on the record, uh, also Cat Power, Sean Marshall, uh, sings sings with me on a song. And she's like the, the most soulful, not the most, but she's pretty damn soulful. Great singer. Right. Well, before we wrap up, i got to ask you about uh, Exene, uh, partly because of the tie to St. Petersburg, where this show is recorded from. Uh, how is she doing, by the way? I know she, 2009, she announced she was dealing with multiple sclerosis. I know you guys are still working together. How is she? She's great. It was misdiagnosed. Evidently, oh. MS is, is incredibly uh, tricky, uh, you know, like lupus or Lyme disease or whatever the hell, you know, new version. So she had a, you know, a, a, a few episodes and then they, did looked at MRIs and said, well, if this was actually MS, then this would have changed and that would have changed and blah, blah. And she said, let me get this straight. Medical doctor. You don't know what the fuck is going on. (laughs) Is that right? Okay. Wonderful. I'm going to go live my life and you all can go fuck yourself. And if I get sick again, I'll come back and see you because you don't know what the hell is going on. So Xene is doing great. And, She's got a three cute little dogs that she uh, <laughs> takes care of, and uh, yeah, we're good partners. And it was uh, <clears throat> really fun to see Terry Gross crushing so hard on on Xene because she's, and you know, we always knew it. You know, she's incredibly entertaining and 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 uh, insightful and funny and and all those things. Hmm. And uh, last question about all this: St. Petersburg, Florida, and Exene. Does she still hold a grudge, or is she uh, is she over it? <laughs> she doesn't. She, I, I think she remembers St. Pete very fondly, and uh, uh, the time she spent in San Antonio, right up the road, down the road, over yeah, north. I, yep. <clears throat> um, no, she remembers that as very very fondly. Or uh, she and her sister. Uh, developed a lot of their style from that and um uh yeah st pete is cool totally cool it's still as as you know we haven't been there in a long time but but i i have fond memories um going back to visit her family going fishing and things like that there well i just got to tell you that st pete as you may if you haven't been here in a long time you will not recognize it if you get the opportunity to come back it's uh it's an amazing little city it's nothing like it was 10 15 20 years ago well, in a good way. Okay, good. No, in a in a very good way. So <laughs> there's plenty of there's plenty of mid-sized cities nowadays that are have changed beyond recognition, not for the better. Uh, Austin would be one of them. Uh, Portland would be another. Um, it's kind of kind of crazy. But. 
Well, considering, Good. considering but, this was this place was known for its green benches and where your grandparents went to die, it's changed for the better. So I just want to put that out there if, if you guys are nice. ever have the opportunity. Uh, if, if it just wasn't so far. Yeah, well, there's that. <laughs> it's so far away from everything. It's like that, that's why bands can't can't come down there for gigs because it's like it's another 800 miles holy crap <laughs> <laughs> you got to commit to doing the whole state if you're going to come I know, this way. yeah I know. it's brutal yeah. well folks listen uh you can find john doe's new book under the big black sun a personal history of la punk in great bookstores everywhere or you can order it and his solo albums or those with the band x including the new the new bit the new album the westerner Right now at a great price at MrMedia.com. Uh, if you're watching on MrMedia.com, just below the video to your right, no doubt, you'll see a copy of the book. You can click on it, order it right now from Amazon, and somewhere else on the page you'll see the, uh, the art for the cover of The Westerner, and you can order it the same way. Have it instantly. John, uh, uh, you're dealing with – do you have a website? Are you doing any social media, Twitter, Facebook, any of that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, I have a Facebook page. Uh, I, I do a little bit of it. My manager does most of it. I'm on Instagram as uh, the John Doe with two E's, T H E E John Doe. Um, sure, you know, I have a Twitter account. It's uh, John Doe from X, and I link that to my Instagram and stuff like that. Cool. All right. yeah. We'll send people that way. Uh, and John, uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you so much for your time for the music and. Uh, continued good luck good health thanks to you and uh, we'll see you down the road Media is recorded live before a studio audience full of aging punks who no longer take pride in torn fishnet stockings and who are using safety pins in ways they never dreamed of in 1978 in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs>